is a CBS News special report. I'm Mark Strassman at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're about to witness the dawn of a new age in spaceflight. This is Launch Pad 39A, just over three miles from our CBS position. That Falcon 9 rocket belongs to SpaceX. And for the first time ever, a private company is about to launch people into orbit. Two astronauts, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, are already strapped into the Crew Dragon capsule. This will be the first human launch into orbit from U.S. soil in almost a decade, since the space shuttle fleet was retired in 2011. Right now, we're just under 12 minutes away from launch. You space buffs know this launch pad has made history before. It's where Apollo 11 began its journey to the moon and where dozens of space shuttle missions rocketed to the sky. Today's crew is headed to the International Space Station, and underlining the historical significance of this day, President Trump is watching in person. But because of the coronavirus threat, NASA has limited the number of spectators and journalists. It's also encouraged the public to watch on television or online instead of gathering on nearby beaches and causeways. Earlier today, Benkin and Hurley suited up for launch. As you can see, the SpaceX suits are much sleeker and more contemporary looking. Gone are the bulky suits astronauts wore for decades. The two astronauts also made the iconic walkout on their pad, uh, on their way to the launch pad. They said goodbye to their wives and kids, a striking image, waving while keeping social distance. Hurley and Benkin then rode to the launch area in a Tesla Model X. It's a bit of marketing by Elon Musk, the founder of both Tesla and SpaceX. Benkin and Hurley have decades of experience. Both joined NASA's astronaut corps in 2000, each married another astronaut from the same class. They both have one young son. They're so close personally, Hurley was the best man at Benkin's wedding. Bob Benkin is 49 years old, a former chief astronaut who flew on two space shuttle missions and has gone on six spacewalks. Benkin is also a former flight test engineer for the U.S. Air Force. Doug Hurley is 53. He also flew twice on shuttles, including the final shuttle mission on Atlantis in 2011. He's a retired colonel in the Marine Corps, a fighter pilot, and a test pilot. We're now just at exactly 10 minutes away from launch. Hurley and Benkin will be flying on a completely new spacecraft, the first new one since the maiden shuttle flight almost 40 years ago. SpaceX has flown 19 cargo missions to the International Space Station, but this is the first time the company is flying people. The 23-story tall, two-stage Falcon 9 is partially reusable. At the top is the Crew Dragon capsule and trunk. At the bottom, the first stage fires nine Merlin engines. They will power the rocket off the launch pad through Earth's dense atmosphere. On the top of the castle, uh, capsule is a nose cone. It will open after reaching orbit, revealing the port that will dock with the International Space Station. And that will happen late tomorrow morning. For the crew's safety, there is an end-to-end onboard abort system. If serious trouble develops at any point from launch to orbit, the system will push the capsule away from the rocket and it will land in the Atlantic Ocean. Bill Harwood is CBS's space consultant. He's covered America's space program for more than 30 years, including 129 space shuttle missions and every SpaceX Falcon 9 launch. Bill, you've been following the countdown for the last few hours. How's it look to you? It's looking pretty good. You know, the concern all along was the weather. This time of year in Florida, uh, you get these afternoon thunderstorms that build up, and of course, they don't want to launch through electrically charged air. They don't want to trigger lightning. Uh, but it's cleared up. It's, uh, it's, it's made a turnaround for us today. The electrical activities dropped down, the clouds have thinned out, uh, and they're go for launch. We haven't heard of any issues with the rocket itself. Uh, propellant load is starting on time about 35 minutes before launch. That's still in process, but it's wrapping up. Uh, so keeping fingers crossed, it's looking pretty good. So I mean, we've heard a lot about how this is going to usher in the commercial age of space. But let's talk about what, what is this mission what does it mean? Why is it so important to NASA? Yeah, you know, we, we've been hearing for days now how important this mission is in terms of opening a new era in commercial space flight and all of that. But for NASA, in the near term, the real goal is to be able to launch astronauts to and from the International Space Station without having to pay the Russians more than $90 million a seat. You know, ever since Atlantis uh, took off on its last flight back in 2011, NASA's been forced to hitch rides with the Russians to the space station. That's something they'd like to end. Uh, this, is, this is a first step in that direction. It, it's still going to continue for a while longer, 
But this is going to end NASA's sole reliance on Russia for basic space transportation. All right, Bill, thanks. We'll check in with you, with you in a second. Uh, I spoke also earlier this week with SpaceX founder Elon Musk. He told me today's historic launch brings added pressure for one simple reason. There are lives on the line. Anything anyone can think of to improve the probability of success and make sure Bob and Doug are, are safely taken to the space station, that is the absolute priority. In fact, I've told the SpaceX team it is, not, it is not simply the top priority, it is the only priority. How does that responsibility weigh on you? Uh, it weighs very heavily. Um, that's really all I can think about right now. I really kind of have to kind of mentally block it because otherwise the, the, it would be emotionally impossible to deal with, frankly. It's that significant. Yes. We want to bring in uh, Garrett Reisman now as we uh, look at President uh, Trump, uh, who's here uh, at Kennedy Space Center. Garrett is a senior advisor for SpaceX. He worked for Elon Musk for seven years, developing, helping develop the Crew Dragon spacecraft. He's also a former astronaut who threw in three different space shuttles. And his first flight was actually with Bob Behnken on Endeavor in 2008. So, Garrett, what makes uh, flying in the Crew Dragon so different from flying in the shuttle? Well, there's some obvious visible differences. Obviously, the sparkling white spacesuits. Uh, the touchscreen displays and even be able to fly the vehicle using the touchscreen and riding to the launch pad in Teslas. Uh, so those are the obvious things, but I think the more significant difference is what you can't see, which is all the advances we've made in electronics and software. This vehicle is much more automated uh, than the space shuttle was. And really, as soon as the rocket lifts off, it's on its own. It's, uh, it's doing its own thing. There's really only one command that either the crew or the ground could send to the rocket while it's in flight and that is to tell it to, sh to shut down in the event of a launch escape. Otherwise, uh, it does its thing. I mean, you know B Bob Beckett and uh, Doug Hurley so well. I mean, what are these guys like? Why is it so, why are they a good fit for this particular mission? Yeah, I think they're, uh, for two extraordinary people, they're some of the most ordinary guys that you'll come across. Uh, and I mean that in a, in a very good way. Uh, both Bob and Doug are very capable, but are really easy to get along with and, and just good people. Uh, Bob, uh, I've known for a very long time, and uh, he's a super smart guy. We were classmates together at Caltech, and he's got a PhD. And sometimes we'd be sitting in meetings at SpaceX, and people would be kind of talking down to him about certain technical topics, not thinking, thinking he was just a, a pilot. Or, and, uh, uh, and, they would, uh, and I knew that Bob knew much more than they did, but he would <laughs> just sit there and he'd just smile. And then Doug is, uh, for a Marine, he's actually a really laid-back guy. <laughs> and they're both a lot of fun. And, and, and for both of them, as they're, as they're in the capsule, strapped in, lying in their back, getting ready for launch, what, what goes through their, an astronaut's mind at this point when we're so close to launch? Well, I'll tell you, you know, as it gets closer, it gets more believable. But up until that point, there's always a doubt in the back of your head about whether or not today is really going to be the day, about whether or not the weather's going to allow you to launch. Uh, and so you're, you're wondering about that until you get to the, the point where now they're arming the launch escape system, they're fueling the rocket, and now it's starting to feel real. But it will really feel real once the engines light up and you get that kick in the pants, and then you know today's the day. Well, this is uh, the second launch attempt uh, of this test flight. Bad weather scrubbed it three days ago on Wednesday afternoon with just under 17 minutes until launch. CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Burdelli joins us now. Jeff, after all this rough weather, how does, the, how does it look now for launch? It is looking better. I mean, just about an hour ago, it did not look good. We had sea breeze, thunderstorms, a lot of lightning, a lot of heavy downpours right on top of Cape Canaveral. But now as we look at the radar, things are starting to quiet down and the storms are dispersing to the west and to the south. So a lot of the energy in the atmosphere is now drained. We had storms early enough. It sucked up the energy and now the sun is coming back out and that is some good news. And as we zoom in, you'll notice in the Melbourne area, there is lightning and thunder. However, that's over 20 miles miles away from the site of launch and generally speaking the criteria the threshold is around 10 miles so as long as storms are more than 10 miles away thunderstorms and lightning is more than 10 miles away generally we are okay and right now as it stands uh, we're looking good over the next few minutes it doesn't look like any big thunderstorms are headed that way 
Okay, Jeff, uh, thanks. Uh, now, uh, today, we will witness several flight milestones as the crew makes their way to orbit when countdown clock, uh, the countdown clock hits zero in just under three minutes. All nine engines on the Falcon 9 a rocket will fire, the liftoff will be underway, and roughly two minutes and 45 seconds into flight, those engines shut down and the first stage separates from the rocket. That bottom portion you see on the left side of the screen flips around. And then here's the remarkable breakthrough in technology. The first stage falls back to Earth and lands right side up on a SpaceX drone ship off the coast. It's recovered and reused for future SpaceX flights. And that has revolutionized the business model of space. The second stage continues the climb to orbit. And roughly 12 minutes into flight, the Crew Dragon capsule separates and reaches orbit. It will take about 19 hours to catch up and dock with the International Space Station, which orbits the Earth at 17,000 miles per hour. Put another way, Los Angeles to New York, 10 minutes. That docking is scheduled to happen about 10.27 tomorrow, Eastern Time. We are nearing now uh, the liftoff, a minute, uh, just a minute 37 away, a minute 36. You know, Bill, we've been talking about this since, uh, what, 2014 when they created this uh, commercial crew program. Is it hard to believe that we're, we're actually now on the verge of it happening? You know, I can't tell you how many tests we've covered, how, how closely we've followed along in the development of the Falcon 9 rocket, but really the Crew Dragon spacecraft we're seeing today. Uh, yeah, I can believe it because there's been a lot of effort that's gone into it. But at the same time, like Garrett said, it's uh, it's getting real here uh, pretty quick. Garrett, getting real, fingers crossed. It's you know <laughs> it, we've been working on this for so long. I mean, the beginnings of the commercial cargo program go back to like the Bush administration, and we've been working on this for 10 years, really hard. And now that we finally reach this moment, that we're inside one minute, it's kind of surreal. Yeah, Bob Benkin, Doug Hurley strapped into the Crew Dragon capsule. We are now 45, under 45 seconds uh, away from launch. Uh, the weather is finally cleared up after uh, being iffy all day long. And now it looks as though uh, all systems have seen to be grow here at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, that, of course, is a huge relief uh, to uh, everybody involved. They've been waiting for this moment uh, really for years. This has been years in the planning, years in the developing. And now that moment is finally here. So why don't we, uh, why don't we pipe down here and just listen to uh, launch control and uh, see how this goes. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, Bob and Doug. Vehicle pitching downrange. One Alpha. Copy, one Alpha. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Falcon power intometry nominal. M1D throttle down. Well, looks like we are uh, on our way. The, the next big uh, moment is uh, Max Q. Garrett, why don't you explain to us what that is? So we've actually passed through the uh, period of the maximum aerodynamic pressure where the wind is the strongest. That's a challenging flight regime. Uh, and we're, we've passed that hurdle. And the next thing that will be coming up is the shutdown of the nine engines in the first stage. That will be very rapidly followed by separation of the stages and ignition of the MVAC vacuum engine, the second stage engine, to take us up into orbit. See uh, uh, President uh, Trump are clapping there. It, it, it all seemed to, it looked picture perfect. Was it? Uh, as far as, everything so far is nominal. Uh, it's really looking like a good flight, and, uh, you know, we got a ways to go here. So, uh, but uh, so far it was beautiful. It's just in, like dreamlike to see that thing actually take off. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to, to watch it, no matter how many times you've seen it before. And nobody has 
probably seen it more than Bill. So, Bill, what were your thoughts as it, as it finally uh, lifted off the pad and we're actually in this new space era? Well, we've seen a lot of Falcon 9s take off, and from that perspective, the launch looked exactly like all the others we've yeah, seen. The difference this time is you know there are two human beings on board, and that gives it a whole different sense of urgency, no question about it. Uh, I want to say we're looking at a camera now that's on the rocket itself looking back at the Earth. Uh, you're getting ready to see stage separation where the first stage will shut down its engines, fall away, and then the flight will continue on the power of the second stage engine. Falcon stage separation confirmed. The view you have on the, on the left side of your screen is looking up at the second stage from the first stage, and the view on the right side is actually the view of the second stage engine, which is now lighting up. Uh, it'll glow red hot. That's how it actually cools itself down. And that first stage uh, will turn around and come on back and, and will attempt to land it on the ship. I mean, we've heard a lot of talk about how this, this is fully automated. So what is it that the astronauts at this point are responsible for? Are, are, they, are they just along for the ride or is there something more to it? At, at this point, they are uh, monitoring the performance. They're looking at their screens to see if they are heading in the right direction at the right speed. Uh, there's really only one command that they can they can use at this uh, during ascent, and that is there's a big handle right there uh, you see in the left screen in the middle of the two of them. That if you pull that, it will light up the Super Draco escape system. And you hear them in the background talking about different two A, two B. These are different things that the Super Dracos will do if you pull that handle right now, or if it automatically goes right now. And Mark, uh, just to jump in real quick, these views we're seeing from inside the cockpit, we've never seen live video of U.S. astronauts uh, in a rocket during launch on a U.S. spaceship. The Russians have done this for, for years, but uh, we've never seen this view uh, for an American launch. And when, he, when Garrett mentioned the escape system, let's talk about that a little bit because that also factored into the weather that we were talking about. It wasn't just weather uh, here on the launch pad, but weather all the way up the East Coast in the Atlantic, really all the way to Ireland, just as a contingency plan. Why don't you explain to folks how exactly that's going to work and making sure that the astronauts always have a way out if something really should go wrong. Yeah, so the... the uh Spacecraft has Super Draco engines. There are eight of them in pairs of two in these in these four pods. And if uh, if the Falcon 9 is having a bad day, they can light up. Now, early on, they would take the trunk with them if that would happen, uh, and the trunk fins would provide stability in the atmosphere. Now, at this point, they would just leave without the trunk, and they can get away from the Falcon 9 very quickly, uh, and in fact, have that luxury of that system all the way up to orbit, which is something we didn't have during shuttle. And depending when it heaven forbid that it, it, it needed to happen but depending when it happened they would land somewhere in the Atlantic and it, it could go what all all the way to Ireland right that's correct so uh, actually we avoid the North Atlantic on purpose uh, at first we will turn back and head to ha uh, Nova Scotia basically Halifax and then once we get a little further along we actually will speed up with the Super Draco engines and head to Shannon Ireland so we will not uh, come down to that that nasty North Atlantic and Bill I, I, I have to imagine that everybody at this point is just thrilled with how this has all gone so far Absolutely, but you know, talking about that crew escape system, the Air Force is still standing by. They have uh, crews stationed in Joint Base Charleston, South Carolina, at nearby Patrick Air Force Base, although they're now beyond the realm where Patrick would come to their aid. Uh, but if there was something unexpected that happened that did make them ditch into the ocean, as Garrett said, avoiding the North Atlantic, uh, the rescue crews on base at uh, Charleston would immediately take off and search these guys down and help them out. But so far, an absolutely picture-perfect launch. Garrett, did you hear anything at all that struck you as... Because it's easy to watch and assume everything's going well, but sometimes if you listen with a trained ear to what, to what the launch c controller is saying, you, you pick up little subtle cues that something is... They're worried about something or thinking about something. Was there any sign of anything? Uh, yeah, no, so far everything seems uh, absolutely perfect. Uh, everything is nominal. Uh, I haven't heard anything that uh, is, is any kind of surprise, which is exactly what you want uh, in these situations. Now we're coming up uh, only about two minutes away from the cutoff of the second stage engine, or SECO, and that would be Bob and Doug getting up into space and, and being uh, uh, pretty much all the way there. Uh, and uh, at the same time, you see on your right of your screen there, that's the first stage uh, of the rocket coming back and heading to land. And they'll, that'll happen in pretty quick succession, the, the landing of the first stage and the cutoff of the engine and Bob and Doug inserted into the correct orbit with the second stage. And Bill, is there any way to, to underestimate the value of this first stage 
coming back to Earth, landing and being reusable as, as it's revolutionized rocketry and revolutionized the business model of space. Well, it really has, and it's not just SpaceX. They're the ones who pioneered this, but their example has, has inspired other rocket builders, uh, their competitors both in the U.S. and in Europe and in Russia, uh, to begin designing their own reusable spacecraft just to be able to compete. Uh, and I'd like to just point out on the right side of the screen right now, you're seeing uh, three of the engines on the, on the first stage firing to slow it back down to plunge back into the thick lower atmosphere uh, so they can line up on the drone ship, whimsically named, of course, I still love you, uh, <laughs> to come in for a landing. But this is something that has uh, really revolutionized uh, the whole space launch industry, no question about it. Garrett, you worked for Elon Musk for seven years. What do you think is uh, going through his, his mind and his heart right now? Um, you know, I bet uh, I bet he's feeling kind of like I am. I'm, I think I'm doing a good job of not showing it, but we're kind of both nervous wrecks. Uh, and uh, I bet he's probably, probably feeling something pretty similar. Because when I talked to him earlier this week, and I, we heard from him too, I mean, there's a huge difference in, in the level of responsibility between flying cargo and flying people, right? He's got two lives are on the line, and, and it's his rocket that's responsible for, and capsule responsible for taking them up and bringing them back. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge step up in uh, responsibility and uh, seriousness and, and consequences of failure. Uh, so uh, we're, we're approaching right now the end of the, the second stage burn. And you hear copy, Shannon, that means that uh, they've entered some of the last of those abort modes, but everything is nominal. And uh, hopefully very soon we're going to shut that engine down and uh, the ascent phase, uh, one of the biggest hurdles of getting into space, will be complete. What do the astronauts feel when that happens? They're feeling right now about four and a half Gs. I think I heard MVAC shut down, so it sounds like we do have a good successful insertion into orbit. They're feeling four and a half Gs. It feels like they weigh about four and a half times as much as they do. And right there at MVAC shutdown, they immediately feel zero Gs and they feel weightless. Dragon copy, nominal orbital insertion. And we hear nominal orbital insertion, so that's, uh, that's great, great news. That's, that, that's what you want to hear. Yeah, not so hard. It all looks as though it could really not have gone any better. I mean, everybody in here has to be thrilled. Absolutely, and you see uh, there we even landed the first stage, so even that went perfectly. Normally, that's a big deal on this particular mission. To me, that's kind of an afterthought. <laughs> I, I just like to see Bob and Doug up there. So uh, let's talk about what the next milestone of the ascent is. Uh, first of all, we're going to have the, the, the first stage is, is probably already flipped around and is on its way back. Oh, it's it's it's, it's almost the way. Down. Oh, it's down. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah, right. It's already landed. I can we, see it now. Yeah. It back. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, and and uh, so the, what's what's coming up next is Dragon now will separate from the second stage. It will pull away from the, the upper stage of that rocket, and then it will, uh, soon after that it will open up its nose cone. That's this piece right here and uh, exposing the docking system and also the navigation sensors. And uh, once that's complete, then that starts a, a slow, roughly 19 hour, slowly creeping up uh, to rendezvous with the space station. And then tomorrow, uh, hopefully we'll see Bob and Doug uh, waving hello from on, on board the ISS. You know, this is, um, this is a test flight. And although everything is, can be automatic, uh, Benkin and Hurley, as former test pilots, are expected to try out some of the systems just to make sure that everything is working as well as it can. So what exactly will they be doing on their way to the space station by way of, of, of testing out various systems that are in the Crew Dragon? Well, one of the biggest uh, tests that they're going to do is they're going to try some manual flying. Now, normally, uh, Dragon is capable and has. Uh, last year, we actually sent a Dragon all the way up and back down to the, from the space station. Uh, completely automatically, autonomously, and that's a normal mode of operation. But there is a, a possibility to take manual control and fly the vehicle manually, and Bob and Doug will, will test it out as test pilots. They'll get a chance to try that. Uh, and they'll, they'll be testing out some other systems, including life support systems, and they're going to they're gonna sleep. They've actually got eight hours to, to, tonight to go to bed, and so they'll be fresh tomorrow to dock to the space station. Yeah, in fact, I heard NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine say earlier today one of their most important jobs is to eat and is to sleep, so they're rested in time uh, for the docking uh, to the space station tomorrow morning. We also uh, just heard from uh, President Trump his reaction to today's launch. He said, it's incredible. Uh, I'm so proud of the, the people uh, at NASA. And we're almost at the 12-minute uh, uh, mark after launch. 
when the astronauts uh, will be in orbit. So we're coming up here, and uh, there it is. There goes uh, Dragon. We have good Dragon separation. And uh, you see the picture there looks beautiful of, of the Dragon trunk uh, pulling away from the second stage. And uh, that's, you know, anytime you have a mechanical event, a separation event, it's something that uh, of special focus, but uh, obviously successful. And next is just a nose cone oper opening. Uh, we have a few words for you from our Falcon 19. <laughs> It's amazing to watch. Uh, the next step really is the docking with the International Space Station. That will happen at 10.27 tomorrow morning, Eastern Time. The Crew Dragon is built to dock autonomously, as Garrett said, but Benkin and Hurley do have the capability to take over if something goes wrong. Once on board the International Space Station, Hurley and Benkin will join the current crew, American astronaut Chris Cassidy and two Russian cosmonauts. Uh, Benkin and Hurley will be in space for at least six weeks and no longer than uh, four months. So it really, any final thoughts, Garrett? How does, this, how does this compare, for instance, to other space milestones that you've either watched or been part of? Yeah, I, th I think the obvious comparison is to the launch, of the first launch of the space shuttle back in 1981. But to me, a lot of what we're doing really harkens back to Apollo. I, I remember taking Bill Anders, uh, Apollo 8 astronaut on a tour of SpaceX, and he remarked at how SpaceX today reminds him so much of what NASA was like during a Apollo. And um, it also, you know, back during his flight, Apollo 8, back in 1968, was another difficult time for our country. It was a time of, uh, we were losing a lot of Americans in the Vietnam War. We uh, had uh, racial conflicts and violence, and uh, we had a, a big division in our society. Obviously, there's, there's echoes to today. When Apollo 8 came back and successfully orbited around the moon, a telegram was sent to the crew saying, thank you for saving 1968. Now, I'm not saying that Bob and Doug just saved 2020, okay? And I'm not saying that what we just did is anywhere near as technologically complicated or as impressive as sending three men around the moon back in 1968. But I hope if you like, were like me, and for at least 10 minutes just now, you looked up, and saw something exciting, something that gave you hope and a, a bright view of a future full of wonder. That's the magic of human spaceflight, and I hope you got that out of that today. Bill? I'm really struck after watching countless Soyuz launches, Russian launches with American astronauts on board. It is a real treat to watch a U.S. rocket take off from U.S. soil with NASA astronauts on board. It's a great feeling. Well, today our nation marked a milestone, sending U.S. astronauts back to space from U.S. soil. A private company has now accomplished what, until now, only countries were capable of. Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin have made history as the first crew of a new age. A big thank you to uh, our entire CBS News team and our guests Bill Harward and Garrett Reisman. Our coverage will continue on our 24-hour streaming network, CBSN. You can watch it also at cbsnews.com or on our CBS News app. There will be more on your local news and on this CBS station and tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Mark Strassman at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com.